The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God is available at www.desiringgod.org. First, a word about sources. Um, they're almost out of these downstairs, but by what's left, the two-volume biography is uh, where I got everything I, I know about his life by Ian Murray, Banner of Truth. And then these three books are my three sources, basically, for what I'm going to say. Revival, Crossway, Joy Unspeakable, and The Sovereign Spirit, Harold Shaw, publishers in this country. If you want a 20-page outline of his life, Five Evangelical Leaders by his grandson, Real fun book to read about Stott and Lloyd-Jones and Schaefer and Packer and Billy Graham, little mini biographies. I hope you all have or will have Preaching and Preachers by Martin Lloyd-Jones. I just dipped into here for a few quotes that, that seem to me crucial. And uh, this is the Bible, <laughs> which is, is in everything. In Preaching and Preachers, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, Preaching has been my life's work. To me, the work of preaching is the highest and the greatest and the most glorious calling to which anyone can ever be called. And even as I read it again, it makes tingles go up and down my back because God has been privileged to call me to preach. I can't get over the awesome privilege of having been called by the living God to herald his truth. Many called him the last of the Calvinistic Methodist preachers because he had Calvin's love for truth and sound reformed doctrine. He was thoroughly Calvinistic and reformed and on the other side, fire and passion. For 30 years, he preached at the Westminster Chapel in London uh, usually that meant three times on a weekend, Friday evening, uh, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening. Most of his time then was spent getting ready for that as well as speaking elsewhere during the week. He said at the end of his career, I can honestly say that I would not cross the road to listen to myself preaching. But most other people who heard him did not share that opinion. J.I. Packer, when he was 22 years old as a student, heard Lloyd-Jones during the 48, 49 years and said that he had never heard such preaching. It came to him with the force of electric shock, bringing to at least one of his hearers, he said, more of a sense of God than any other man. They did have a kind of falling out later on, which is sort of sad, but Packer never, never stopped praising Lloyd-Jones. Not to this day. In fact, I recommend the book by Samuel T. Logan called... Uh, Preachers and Preaching, I believe, something like that. And Packer writes, Why Preach as the lead essay, and it's dynamite, and it's got more of Lloyd-Jones in it. Many of us have felt this electric shock, though we never knew him personally, though we can hear him on tape if you want to. Uh, we felt it even coming through his books. I can remember as a student in 1967 going to Urbana with my fiancé, Noel, and hearing George Verwer, as he always does, hold up a book and say, this is the most important book that's been written in whatever amount of time he says. And he held up in that time the two-volume work by Martin Lloyd-Jones on the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, this is the greatest book that's been written in this century. Well, he had no right to say that because he doesn't read all the books. But I said, that is an amazing statement. I went home, and in the summer of 1968, I read those two volumes through before I went to seminary. That was between college and seminary. And I, I was never the same again. I was primed for the theology I discovered at seminary by this awesome uh, picture of the Lord the greatness and weight of spiritual issues is what Packer said very few men have been able to duplicate. Just a real brief sketch of his life. His pathway to Westminster was uh, unique. He was born in Cardiff, Wales, 
in December 20, 1899. Then he moved to London uh, with his family when he was 14, went to medical school at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, got his MD in 1921. His uh, supervisor said he was the most acute thinker that he'd ever known. He had a profound conversion experience during the 1921-23 year, and his passion to preach just exploded so strongly that he left behind the medical career, never, never to return in any official way. He took a church in uh, Sandfields, Aburavon, or however you pronounce that uh, Welsh uh, area, and married Bethan Phillips, January 8th of 1926, and they had two daughters, Elizabeth and Anne, over the course of their marriage. He stayed there, I think, about uh, 12 years. And then he was in Philadelphia preaching. And uh, Martin Lloyd, I mean, uh, G. Campbell Morgan, was in the audience, sitting at the back, the pastor of Westminster Chapel, and heard this young man preach and felt, I must seek this man to be my associate at the Westminster Chapel. And he did seek him, and through a series of events, got him to come. Uh, that was about, that was September 1939, and uh, in 1943, G. Campbell Morgan retired, and um, until 1968, the preaching pastor of Westminster Chapel was Martin Lloyd-Jones. He retired in 1968, uh, worked on his writings for 12 years as well as speaking, and then he died in his sleep March 1st, 1981. From the beginning of his life, Martin Lloyd-Jones was, in a sense, a cry for depth. If I were to sum up, I almost titled this, A Cry for Depth. If I ever do anything with it, I might title it that. A Cry for Depth in two areas. One, in biblical doctrine, and two, in vital spiritual experience. So. Light, heat, logic, fire, word, spirit. Again and again, he would be fighting on two fronts. He would be fighting against dead, formal, institutional intellectualism on the one side, and he would be fighting against superficial, glib, entertainment-oriented, man-centered emotionalism on the other side. He looked out over the world and, and thought it was in an absolutely desperate condition, and he saw the church as very weak and impotent. He said one wing of the church was straining out the gnats of intellectualism, and the other was swallowing the camels of evangelical compromise and careless charismatic teaching. And for Lloyd-Jones, the only hope was historic, God-centered revival which is really what I want to talk about this morning. So my aim is, is this, to talk about the meaning of revival, as Lloyd-Jones understood it, the, source, uh, the sort of power he was seeking, what he thought it would look like when it came, and how he thought we should seek it, and then I'm going to really risky at, be risky at the end and, and ask if he practiced what he preached. More than any other man in this century, I think Lloyd-Jones has helped recover the historic meaning of revival. Quote, a revival is a miracle, something that can only be explained as the direct intervention of God. Men can produce evangelistic campaigns, but they cannot, never have, produced a revival. And Lloyd-Jones felt it to be a tremendous tragedy that the historic sense of revival as a sovereign outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church had been virtually lost by the time he preached about revival in 1959 on the 100th anniversary of the Welsh revival. He said in those lectures, during the last 70 to 80 years, this whole notion of a visitation a baptism of God's Spirit upon the church has gone. And then he gives this explanation, and with this he begins to part ways with almost the entirety of mainline evangelicalism. The main theological reason 
that he said there was a prevailing indifference to historic revival and crying out to God 